What is happening out there, Roto Scouts baseball fans? Welcome to a rainy Tuesday in the New York City area, coming to you from Jersey City, right across the river from Manhattan. But it is coming down out there. It looks like it's come, it's let up a little bit over the last uh, couple of minutes. I took Joker out before he wasn't happy about the rain. Came back in dripping wet. I bring this up at the top of the show because we've got a uh, Mets game that's severely threatened by rain. According to Mr. Roth over at uh, RG, though, it does seem like it might have a window later in the evening if they decide to delay by like two hours, start you know, closer to 9, 30, 10 o'clock. I don't know that they're going to be inclined to do that. The Mets already rained out their home opener. I think it's going to be a quicker trigger than that, but we'll see. It's one to keep an eye on. A little bit of weather out in Chicago today on uh, Tuesday as well. But we're just getting started here. Cujo Blue's in the chat already. Hope everybody's Tuesday's going well. Hope your Tuesday's going well too, pal. Once again, just all baseball focus for me. Pretty good Monday. Profitable day. Had a bunch of chasers. We were, oh, we were so close. Just didn't land on the right combination of uh, Astros and cards. But had a bunch of good ones. Reese Olsen coming out of his start. One out away from the quality start. Hurt us on FanDuel a little bit. Had a decent day, but just didn't get that bonus and obviously didn't get the win. They were 0-0 into uh, the late part of that game, I think, into extra innings. It is. Excellent, Cujo. Good to hear, buddy. Um, But, yeah, that game was tied at 0 late, so no win bonus, no quality start bonus. Killed Olsen a little bit, took the top off. Obviously, the monster start out of Ronel Blanco, who I think we have to take it seriously. Um, had a good spring, you know, uh, wasn't really taking the spring into too much consideration as we've talked about. It's not the biggest thing for me. Um, but obviously coming out and throwing a no hitter in the first start of the season, having a really effective start, um, at least puts him on the board going forward. We got to pay attention to him. Had a dominant start out of Tanner. How could we talked about who we liked a lot? Struck out 10 of the athletics. I think we're going right back to the well with Red Sox pitching today. Interesting slate. It's a nine-gamer lined up tonight. Could become a six-gamer awfully quickly. Like I said, New York, mm, dicey. And then two games in Chicago, also a little bit dicey looking. But uh, as Chan Zero is just pointing out in the chat, there is some juicy pitching on the board. I think we've got a couple interesting discount guys. I think we've got some very high price, just quality, just aces off the top. So we'll take a look. We'll go through everything. Mama's here. Mama took down 6K last night. Beautiful, dude. That's awesome. Mama says, damn, almost won it all. Lock button on Blanco in Houston. Went with Yankees three men instead of Sox one 6K. That's awesome. Good to see for one of the regulars. Love it. Love it. Wish it was the takedown. That would have been great. We'll get him, though. We'll get him. Like I said, I was, oof. I wanted that one last night. I was on that one. I was on that one couple small misses you know obviously yeah uh, Tristan McKenzie off the top of the board uh, as the highest priced highest projected pitcher didn't do well that was a miss so I'll claim the misses just as much as I'll claim the hits I did not say that Ronel Blanco was a good play yesterday so that was a good call by you but glad we got there buddy Dennis is in the house Dennis saying Mets should get these early games in before all their pitchers get hurt over the next few months <laughs> I'll respond with what pitchers? Although Sham and I had a day yesterday. They've got a little bit. Lone Wolf's here. Chan's here. Mamba's here. Bunch of other people hanging out anonymously, which is totally fine. Tune in. Listen in. Don't chat. Whatever. It's cool. Just glad you're here. If you get a chance, hit the like button. It helps a little bit somehow back in the algorithms. I have no idea how it actually works. Yanks and the Diamondbacks on the screen because we got the Diamondbacks lineup in uh, just a couple minutes ago. And as you'll notice, big missing name in the top of the lineup. No Corbin Carroll for the D-backs tonight. Um, helps Nestor Cortez a little bit. Lowers the um, requirement to get to the Diamondbacks all that much. I think you can still definitely go there. I don't think all that much of Nestor at this point. And we'll go back to this game in a second. But I bring it up because uh, that's obviously a big absence. It also lowered the run total by uh, by a half a run. I don't know if it was directly that or if it had come down a half a run and I hadn't noticed yet and it was just happenstance. Um, but the game evened out. It's uh, minus 104 on both sides. 4.30 uh, implied total for both teams. Eight and a half run total in that one now. So even lower end 
Yankees D-backs game. Both teams project out okay because there are good players on both teams, primarily the Yankees like we've talked about with just, you know, a couple superstars and then surrounded by some very good players. So they're only going to slip so far down the board on most nights, but they're going up against Zach Gallon's killer, killer starter. Uh, the other confirmed lineup that we got in is the Rockies. Rockies dropping Chris Bryant down the lineup. We'll get to that one in just a sec, but that one's under threat of rain, um, which could suck because Javier Assad is uh, the guy I was referring to as an interesting value option today. But let's start at the top. If you guys uh, are, are watching for lineups and uh, you want to let me know, we can. Uh, I'm not going to try and like you know type them in and everything. Like I see the uh, the Mets and the White Sox both just dropped. All right, let's see if we can do a quick copy paste at least for these. That's close to who's that? Tyrone Taylor. All right, we can get that Mets one in. Uh, so here, let me just grab these. All right, so the Mets are going with the usual top end, Nimo Lindor, Petey Alonso. Uh, they're moving Francisco Alvarez up again, which um, seems like a much better, better decision than having Jeff McNeil hitting there. I think that's the seventh spot. So uh, Alonso, Alvarez, uh, Brett Beatty moving up the lineup here. Interesting spot into the fifth spot. And then Marte goes there. This is fun. Marte there. Then McNeil. Then Tyrone Taylor. And I will click on it to find out who's hitting ninth. Harrison Bader is hitting ninth. So Bader in that spot. So that's the Mets lineup. And then the other one we just got in. I know I started that by saying I wasn't going to type these in. But since these two are here now, what I meant was as we're rolling through these games, I won't stop to type it in. Um... This is against a, a righty as well. Reynaldo Lopez going for the Braves today. Kind of interesting spot. All right, so the White Sox confirmed is... Let's see. Benny, Moncada, Robert, uh, Sheets, then Vaughn. As um, hopefully you guys had money on Eloy Jimenez will get hurt this year because he's hurt. Came up uh, lame on a running to first base, I believe, yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Um, regardless, not in the lineup today. Um, a, yet again, major ding to the White Sox lineup. One of their, you know, two and a half good power hitters. Uh, so anyway, it goes uh, Robert Vaughn. Uh, sh sorry, Robert. Sheets. Vaughn. Shoemake. I think that's his name. Dom Fletcher. Then Nicky Lopez, Martin Maldonado back to his traditional, whoops, traditional nine spot. Okay, so this was a quick tour through the White Sox lineup. Won't be worth all that much. Is it Brendan Shoemaker? Is it Braden Shoemaker? Is it something, something silly? I forget this dude's first name. Braden, I knew it. Braden Shoemake. All right. For the rest of the show, <laughs> what we're going to do when lineups drop is we'll take a look at them and we'll talk about how they're going to be different, but we're not going to stop and put them into the model. <laughs> That's just annoying. Game one off the top. Uh, again, a lot of rain in the New York area. There is, uh, Roth is out there saying that they might be able to delay by two, three hours and maybe play this one late. Um, not, not overly optimistic about that. The Mets starting Adrian Hauser, 111 and a third last year, 21 starts, put up a 20% strikeout rate, 4.12 ERA, a 4.30 X FIP, perfectly serviceable kind of a starter, only 6,800 on DraftKings. I think he fits into the SP2 conversation on DraftKings at 8,200. He projects out just fine against the Tigers here. Um, I do think the Tigers are a good team this year. So I do think it's, you know, 
there's interesting upside there on their side. But Hauser, enough talent to maybe succeed. I just don't know that you need to go to it at 8,200 on the FanDuel board. Like, it's an okay projection, but it puts him here against, yeah, these guys are higher priced, but there's a lot of much better pitchers in much better spots than this. So I don't love Hauser. I think you could go to some Tigers. I like some of the lefties in that lineup. Parker Meadows is more interesting against a righty when he's hitting up toward the top of the lineup. Nineteen, uh, excuse me, three home runs and eight stolen bases in 145 plate appearances last year. I think a lot of Spencer Torkelson in all situations as a power hitting first baseman. 3,100, 4,900. He's very, very cheap for his talent. 31 home runs in 684 plate appearances last year. A monster contact profile. Kerry Carpenter, good lefty with power. 20 home runs in 459 last year and a solid triple slash. Gets on base, hits for average. Riley Green, breakout campaign last year. 11 home runs, 7 steals, 119 WRC plus in 416 plate appearances with an also very strong triple slash. So another really good lefty with a lot of ceiling on him. Very good contact profile. Throwing these four guys up against... You know, a, a good, not great pitcher, an okay, not... It was probably more like okay, not good. You know, he's league average-ish. I think there's definitely upside, especially with three pretty strong lefties in the top of the lineup. Then you go down the lineup a little bit. You've got Colt Keith, their premium rookie that they called up out of... Uh, that they brought out of camp. Only 2,400. Fits at third base on FanDuel. 3,000 second base only on uh, DraftKings. I prefer him on DraftKings just because of the positioning. I'd rather take that shot at second base than at third base. Third base, a little bit more of a premium position around the league. So it's a bigger sacrifice. But I think there's nothing but upside for Cole Keith. He's another lefty. He's got power. He's supposed to hit for average on base. The works. Really premium high-end prospect. So given that several of those guys, this is kind of the opposite of why I didn't like the Tigers and I like Sean Manaya yesterday, because they have so many lefties. They didn't start Colt Keith against the lefty. They went a little bit right-handed. But when they do that, they're putting in some substandard type players. Um, but now that they're lining up against a hittable righty in Hauser, I, I kind of like these lefties. I don't love the bottom of the lineup. McKinstry, and, uh, McKinstry is you know an afterthought. Baez just disengaged still. Hopefully he gets going at some point. That would make this more fun because it would give his the talent can't have just evaporated, right? It seems more like an effort and interest thing. Um, but he's there. Thirty six hundred is cheap for you know the reasonable ceiling that we expect that he still has. Twenty six hundred on FanDuel is very cheap. Jake Rogers is interesting as a catcher. He had twenty one home runs in three hundred and sixty five plate appearances at a two twenty four ice. A lot of power from the catcher position for Jake Rogers. Um, but some inconsistency and can definitely put some zeros in your lineup with that 30% strikeout rate. Just a 7.7% walk rate last year, 286 on base. So there's some give and take with the quality with Rodgers. I think there's catchers that we like better. For example, I'm pretty sure Jainer Diaz is right back at 3,300 after hitting two home runs yesterday. Hopefully some people played him as a one-off one -off catcher or in their Astros stacks. That one I know we hit. Um, no, we'll we'll look for him later. But I just think, I mentioned him because I think that's a better catcher one-off if you're looking to one-off it than taking a Jake Rogers. He's going to be hitting fifth again, probably. Taking a Jake Rogers from the eighth spot for 100 more doesn't really add up for me. Casey Mize making his first start back after uh, two years gone. Had 150 innings pitched back in 2021, 30 starts. Uh, went down for Tommy John surgery after uh, two starts in 2022. Didn't pitch at all in 2023. 19.3% strikeout rate over 150 and a third in 30 starts back then. 3.71 ERA, a 4.37 xFIP. Is all right, kind of a league average performance over over that stretch. And I don't really have much faith in the first start back after Tommy John and that long of an absence. And you just pile on the pile on anything you want. And in that okay season a couple of years ago, he did give up a 10% barrel rate, 3.92% home run rate. So he was pretty gettable. Going up against a Mets team that is you know, kind of middle of the road, but at least at the top end has plenty of talent. Didn't I change this? Jeff McNeil's not supposed to be there. Did I fail to paste that in the right spot? What the fuck? I did. There we go. So with the top end, and I actually prefer this 
configuration of this top end. Francisco Alvarez in the cleanup spot is kind of a natural. Moving Brett Beatty up against a probably mediocre righty as a left-handed hitter with some decent contact skills, if nothing else. Kind of interesting, because especially for us, because he's cheap. 2600 on Dra- on FanDuel, 3100 on DraftKings. Starling Marte still is interesting and still is cheap across sites. I think he's got upside for you know a little bit of pop, a little bit of return to form, some speed. Tyrone Taylor even is kind of interesting when he's in the lineup. He hits the ball fairly hard. More of an asset against lefties, but not uninteresting as a cheap option with Harrison Bader down there. Between the two, I prefer Tyrone Taylor. But it's really about the top end for the Mets. Nimmo's a terrific leadoff hitter. He's only 4,500 on DraftKings. That is too cheap for Brandon Nimmo. I'm going to continue pointing it out. Um, at 24 home runs last year. He gets on base at a 363 clip ahead of Francisco Lindor, Pete Alonso, and now Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty. It's just a good group to be on base in front of. So when he's not hitting home runs on his own or doubling or whatever, he's getting himself to first base at the very least. 193 ISO last year. Creator runs 30% better than average to lead this team last year. Nimmo is very, very good for the 4,500, 3,100 that he costs. These two guys are stars. They combined for 77 home runs last year. Both had a 121 WRC plus last year. Lindor is an everyday shortstop. You know, any given slate, you can play him against basically anybody. PD Alonso, you can play against basically anybody. And I would argue that Alonso is underpriced at 52. Given the way the DraftKings prices for 46 home runs last year, I know it's a little bit less valuable on the DK side, but that's a lot of power. That's a lot of ceiling on any slate for for 52, given where some other guys are priced on this slate. So kind of like Alonso there. I like the three-man combo there, and now that you got these two guys, I kind of like it as a straight-line five-man. I actually think a decent amount of Brett Beatty. I know he didn't have a great year last year. 389 plate appearances, a rookie 212, 275, 323, with only a 110 ISO and 32% worse than average creating runs. That's a messy, messy season, no doubt about it. But what I like, what he sustained, was the 43.4% hard hit rate. An okay barrel rate, if he improves this, that turns into more than nine home runs over a full season. So I think he's cheap for a little bit of sneaky lefty pop at third base. Not my, again, not my favorite spot. Neither corner, third or first, aren't the spots that I like to take big discount plays. Um, but I think, he, I think he justifies it. And especially if you're stacking Mets, like it just helps the cheap price helps average down the cost of the other guys. And you are getting a star at shortstop. So there's kind of a give and take there between that. If you take a star at short, you can afford to you know take a, a somewhat lesser option at third. Um, so I like the five man. I can build Starling Marte into that one, 3,600, 3,000. If nothing else, he's got speed left. I think there's more than that. Jeff McNeil's the guy I don't love, but, um, the hit tool is, is there. If his bad bip is strong, he tends to have a decent season. Second base and outfield eligible th- for 3,500. I do think you can stack up Mets against Casey Mize here. If this game plays a lot of threat to this game playing at all. So DraftKings, Adrian Hauser is an SP two. I think is reasonable. Wouldn't really play him on FanDuel, despite a decent projection. Like I said, I think he just gets kind of lost in the shuffle on the FanDuel slate. And I think a little bit too much of this Tigers team, particularly their lefties, to really want to go to him at that price. I just think it's an okay value mark on uh, the DK slate. But I wouldn't expect him to go through clean. Like, I think there's a couple runs, but maybe you find some strikeouts along the way. All those kids do strike out at a decent clip. You've got Mark Kana hiding in the middle of that lineup, bringing down the strikeout average. But everybody else in that lineup can definitely strike out. Adrian Hauser, not really the guy to to go get him, but he can have his upside days. Um, so that was uh, just Hauser on DK. Um, yes to some Tiger stacks. I do think, especially if you're building out 150 lineups, I definitely think they warrant some stacks. I like the you know focus on the top four plus Colt Keith. You can work Mark Conn into some of them. You can throw in some Jake Rogers catcher shares for cheap. And then Javi Baez, the washed up star, is kind of still lingering there. Mets side, primarily the top five. And then maybe bolt on some Starling Marte, Tyrone Taylor, if you build a lot of them. All right, Rockies going up against the Cubbies. This game's also got rain in the area, but uh, as does the White Sox game. Uh, but Roth moved them up. And again, we, we just kind of default to uh, professional meteorologists. Pick who you like. But since Roth focuses on TFS and baseball and provides these uh, updates, it's kind of easy to default to him. Um, so he moved this, the two Chicago games, both to, on his scale, yellow-green, right? So playable. This is in his free report, by the way. I wouldn't give, his, give away his pay stuff. Um, there's a lot of wind blowing out in the White Sox game, and I believe, yeah, uh, wind bl- out left to right 
at a pretty good clip in uh, Wrigley, which when the wind's blowing out in Wrigley, there's always a good cause to go there. Um, but cold weather, we're not quite in the, in summer yet. That matters more in day games at Wrigley, which we get a lot of through the summer. Um, and the Rockies, you know, pretty team's been pretty lousy. The lineup's pretty lousy. I know I have said already this year that I do think that, uh, especially at price, they're a little bit better than maybe their reputation. But Rockies on the road against a righty, uh, as I've also said, has been a thing for just years and years. And I think it justifies some shares in Javier Assad for just 6,600 on the DraftKings slate and even more importantly, 6,200 on the FanDuel slate. That's your discount bullet of the day um, for sure. You can see where he landed on the pitching board. Look at his green low cheap price compared to everybody else. The next cheapest guy who projects the highest is actually Casey Mize in a game that's quite likely to rain out. Um, you could also, you know, delays are weird for pitchers, especially a kid coming back from Tommy John, especially if he starts the game, has to stop for a little while because it starts raining again. And then, you know, that's a mess. Then you go back to a couple expensive guys, Miles Michaelis, who I do not want to play against San Diego, even at 68, 62, there's really nothing else in that territory. Ronaldo Lopez, maybe, if you believe, but even he's 300 more than Assad. Assad's got one of the best matchups in baseball for 6,200 on FanDuel. It's a potentially killer spot. I'm not going to get, like, I, I liked the crochet play a lot more on opening day just because that kid's got killer strikeout upside. We're going to talk about him in just a second. Javier Assad. Not necessarily the same strikeout upside. 10 starts last year, 109 and a third in a hybrid role. A lot of work out of the pen. 305 ERA, a 435 XFIP. Did walk 9.1%. That's a little bit high. Swinging strike rate and CSW were nothing to write home about at all, but was decent at limiting power. Just 41.2% hard hits, 87.6 miles an hour of exit velo, and a 2.9% home run rate. Year before that, just 18.1% in 37 and two thirds. 311 ERA, a 492 XFIP. So, you know, the re the results are not great. Javier Assad is not an ace by a pretty long stretch of the imagination, but this is not a very good baseball team. I do think they've got some good players. I do think for DFS, they're going to be interesting in some spots, uh, even outside of Coors Field this year. It's just, I think we can go to the, the Assad side. So cue the, cue the 12 run Rockies outburst, of course. Um, if you are going to the Rocky side, take a contrarian uh, pose against what will probably be not a high-owned Assad play, but I think there will be some sharp players on it. So if you want to take a contrarian position against those people in, in particular, Blackman's okay. He gets on base at a decent clip off the top, but he doesn't have power anymore. He's just an average and on base guy, so he needs correlation with his, uh, with his teammates. Brendan Rodgers in the two spot for 3,600, 2,500. Not uninteresting. Just 192 plate appearances last year, four home runs, 258, 313, 388. Um, 581 plate appearances the year before, hit 13 home runs, 15 in 415 plate appearances back in 2021. Formerly a fairly high-end prospect, still enough time to maybe pull things together. Um, not a high-end guy by any means, but playable if you're stacking this team. Nolan Jones, I really like. I think he's the best player on this team. Went 20-20 in just 424 plate appearances last year. Chris Bryant, revenge, yada, yada. Doesn't matter at all in baseball. There's no, you can't want to hit a baseball more. Um, it just doesn't work that way. The sport doesn't work that way. So get the revenge thoughts out of your heads. Uh, but yes, he is back in Wrigley Field. I think he probably misses playing for the Cubs. If anything, it's a, uh, you know, oh, please trade, trade, get me back kind of a spot for Chris Bryant. But at 4,000, I, I like the upside. I like the value. 2,600 on FanDuel. If you're going to this team, you you include Chris Bryant in your lineups. I know he missed on us the other day, put up like a six when we had him as the home run pick and some of the guys around him went off, but we don't sweat that. Ryan McMahon, reasonable enough at 4,100, 2,800, second base and third base eligible on FanDuel. 23 home runs from the left side. A lot of his value comes from playing at Coors Field, though. You prefer him greatly in um, home starts. But as one of the few lefties in this lineup, I do think there's a little bit of value there. So a three-man of probably Jones, Bryant, McMahon would be my preference with this team. I do think you could go down the lineup from those guys. Elias Diaz is whatever as a catcher. 
hit, did, hit, did hit 14 home runs with a decent triple slash last year, but was 19% worse than average creating runs overall. Ezekiel Tovar had a lot of buzz going into last year, kind of underperformed the season, but did still hit 15 home runs, steal 11 bases. So it's a little bit of counting stat upside for Tovar, and we've got room to grow. Michael Toglia is a kid who's supposed to have a decent amount of power. He only hit four home runs and 152 plate appearances last year, went 163, 224, 284. Uh, I was thinking Eliodorus Montero would be in that spot in the uh, projected lineup. But I think Togli has got a reasonable amount of upside. Did manage a 44% hard hit rate across those 152 plate appearances. So something to cling to for value. Brent Doyle's got a little bit of power and speed value. Uh, 10, 10 home runs, 22 steals, but an awful triple slash across 431 plate appearances. That's just who the Rockies are. I mean, just you get pretty bad triple slashes. You get a little bit of power outbursts, a couple steals here and there. Obviously terrible for run creation because they don't really have anything to help one another out. It's a bad baseball team, but there are spots. If you're rostering them again, I think the two prime lefties, and you can include Charlie Blackman in that. If you wanted to go one, three, four, five, and one of these guys, I think that's workable. Would probably be Tovar for me in that situation because then you you get the loose hope that Tovar gets on base and these two miss and then he wraps back around to Blackman. That's not why I, I mean that is why he would be the guy over these two guys. Doyle's got a little bit of that, but his on base at 250 sucks. Not that Tovar was much better at 287 last year. A little bit of speed from both of those guys. I do think if this game plays, you can absolutely target the Cubbies against Kyle Freeland. Some pretty good mid-range home run numbers. Nobody over the magic number of 10. They don't have a lot of, they don't have any guys who had 30 home runs last year. I do think Bellinger's got 30 home run upside. He hit 26 last year. Chris Morrell, maybe, if he plays a full 600-plus plate appearances, probably 30 home run upside. He had 26 in 429 plate appearances last year. The other guy's probably not, but we do have good like twenty mid-20s type home run hitters kind of up and down the board on this team. And they're going up against Kyle Freeland, which is just kind of a uh, bonanza of potential fantasy points on a lot of slates. 5.03 ERA last year, a 5.13 XFIP, extremely hittable for power, 4.28% home run rate, 43.3% hard hits, 8.7% barrels, 90 plus miles an hour of exit velo, this, this, even that, this isn't quite where I would want it for, you know, an obvious power target, but all the rest of this is. So Kyle Freeland, definitely targetable for power. A lot of these guys hit from the right side to boot. Cody Bellinger, I'm not really worried about lefty-lefty against this lefty by any means. Ian Happ's a switch hitter, so we're getting most of those guys if this is the lineup from the right side against Freeland here. And the best thing about going up against Freeland, 13.9% strikeouts last year, 7.8% swinging strike rate, and only a 22.4% CSW. He is so super hittable, it's ridiculous. I'll remind you that the wind is blowing out in Wrigley. As much as it maybe didn't matter uh, as a factor for the for the Rockies, I'll spin it the other way, and we'll say that uh, with all this bat-on-ball potential with pretty solid uh, exit velocity possibilities, I like the Cubbies upside here. So I think we only need this game to play for the Cubbies to be relevant. You can see pretty strong projections for the top four. Nico Horner, decent on-base guy, 346 last year, and stole 43 bases, decent batting average on the front end. Only created runs 2% better than average, doesn't hit for much power at all. Um, part of that is on some of the guys you know, not knocking him in, but not a lot of hard hit, not a lot of anything other than just get getting to first base and maybe some steals. Then it's all up to everybody else in the lineup to help him out. Seiya Suzuki is absolutely hitting everything hard this year. He did pretty good job of that last year, 10.5% barrels, 48% hard hits. Following up, he moved the hard hits up, lost a little tiny sliver of barrels, but it doesn't really matter. Hit 20 home runs, went 285, 357, 485 last year. 26% better than average creating runs. So say a Suzuki is an interesting option behind Horner. Good option to drive him in. And he only costs 4,400, 3,200. This especially is pretty cheap for a guy who just absolutely has been hitting lasers so far this season and was pretty good last year. That's a real, I mean, that's a really good season. The runs in RBIs are 25 lower than, you know, a star would necessarily put up in that spot. But 20 homers, the 285, 357 on the front end. He did have a 200 ISO. Didn't get over 500 slug, but had a 200 ISO and tons of hard contact. A little bit of happenstance changes in there, and I think he's, you know, well over uh, some of those marks. Would you calm down? Joker's all excited about the Cubs. I don't know why. 
Cody Bellinger had the monster bounce back last year, went up to 307, 356, 525. Oddly, didn't barrel much, didn't have much hard hit, didn't do that the year before either, but uh, got himself back to 26 home runs, a 218 ISO, creator runs 34% better than average. Couldn't find a better gig. One of the victims of the uh, Scott Boris curse in the offseason this year. Nobody wanted to give Boris's clients what they wanted. Uh, ended up coming back to Chicago, and I think it's a good spot for him. I really do. The best thing that he did last season, lowered his strikeout rate. And I pointed this out all throughout the year last year as the prime factor in why he got good again. Cut the strikeouts by 12 percentage points year over year. 27.3% in 2022, down to 15.6%. He was a different hitter. And still managed to hit 20, 26 home runs, stole 20 bases, just remade himself and uh, became very, very good again. For the price, on FanDuel, he's kind of discounted at 34, multi-position eligible, 54, about right on DraftKings, multi-position over there too. Morel for 45, a lot of power there, triple position eligible for 34 on FanDuel. And sign me up for that. He's got a team leading 7.67 in the home run model going up against Kyle Freeland, who gives up a lot of power as a lefty, a bad lefty, a lot of contact. Look at all this premium contact that Chris Morrell made 15.5% barrels, 50% hard hits last year. It, it might not be the best hitter overall 247, 313, 508, but a 260 ISO, all that premium contact that, re, I mean, the ISO results from the premium contact, but. Yes, Chris Morrell, big yes today. I really like that spot. Dansby Swanson and Ian Happ. I really, I always like these guys. People who've been watching shows that I've been on for the last couple of years probably know that I really like Dansby Swanson. I really like Ian Happ. I talk about them a lot. Swanson's got a long track record of being a very good power hitting shortstop. 25 homers two years ago, 27 the year before that. He's consistently hit 25 ish home runs over the last you know handful of seasons that he's been in uh, in the league 22 last year bit of a dip 172 iso still created runs four percent better than average has one on the board this year barrels the ball pretty consistently the hard hits were down a little bit down from 46.1 to 39.5 i like him to get right back to this get over 25 home runs in a good lineup this year ian hap 248 360 431 what i love about a lot of these guys is their on base ability You've got solid, three solid on-base guys there, a solid on-base guy here. They're good at resetting the table for one another down the lineup. Ian Happ has power of his own. He's a switch hitter. You can get him from both sides, 4,600, 3,400 across sites. Correctly priced on FanDuel, maybe, yeah, it's probably correct on DraftKings as well. Decent home run marks through that middle part of the uh, of the lineup. Nobody up at 10, but all these guys halfway there at least, trending up toward that 7.6 for uh, Chris Morrell. Bottom of the lineup, I don't love Nick Madrigal, if this is what we get. Garrett Cooper, let me jump back to the chat, see if you guys are screaming about, about anything. Garrett Cooper is all right for right-handed power, 3,700. Did have a good barrel rate, decent hard hit last year, same thing a year before. Only 23 on the FanDuel slate. That's kind of interesting if he's in the, uh, if he's in the lineup here because you get him against the lefty, which is what he specializes in. He did hit 17 home runs, 251, 304, 419 last year. Below average ISO, below average uh, WRC+. Plus, but he's very, very cheap with a little bit of power upside um, against a bad pitcher. And you can play Cody Bellinger in the outfield if you wanted to. It's not that big a stretch from there to there. I prefer something like, you know, those three and one of these two on FanDuel. It's probably a better fit on DraftKings where you can also play Cody Bellinger in the outfield and you get five of these guys. So if you wanted to go from here down and just choose, you know, choose your weapons, I think that makes some sense. Madrigal, I don't really like at second base. Um, you know, no, no real pop to speak of. Not a great bat by, uh, you know, not nearly a great bat, 0.8% barrel, 27.5% hard hits last year. Stole 10 bases in 294 plate appearances, good for him. Jan Gomes, kind of interesting. 36.4% hard hits, 7.8% barrels. Did hit 10 home runs in 419 plate appearances last year. Had 8 in 293 the year before. 14 going back in time to 2021 in 375 plate appearances. A little bit maybe of sneaky catcher pop, but again... If you're one-offing it, I wouldn't go here. He's hitting ninth versus, again, you got Jainer Diaz coming right back, hitting probably fifth. And Gomes is 200 more than Jainer Diaz, who hit two home runs yesterday and is a phenomenal young catcher. I think you've also got Gabriel Moreno on the board for a little bit less than that. So I just don't love the price and the way it functions positionally for Gomes. 
but I do think there's upside, and if you're stacking, I think he's playable. On FanDuel, you don't need the catcher spot, but if you build a ton of Cubby stacks, I do think you should work him into a couple. So, uh, Javier Assad for value. Definite yes on both sides. I like it. I think we go there. Rockies on the road against the righty. They're just bad. Um, I think you could take a little minor hedge position, especially if Assad ever got out to popularity. Uh, but I do think some of those lefties, Charlie Blackman, Nolan Jones, uh, Ryan McMahon, plus Chris Bryant, maybe a little bit of potential. Um, total dice roll, you know, low ownership contrarian type play. Um, and not something I'm recommending. I'm just saying if that's your choice, those are your guys. Cubby's bats, big yes for me. Um, at the very least, one through uh, two through six with a little bit of one, a little bit of seven, if that's the, the lineup that we get. Got to pick up the pace. Got to remember that I've got to do uh, NBA projections after this. Forgot that during the show yesterday and uh, had to scramble a little bit. People still playing NBA, you lunatics. All right, here's our, here's our guy from the other day. Garrett Crochet, monster success at a very low price to start the season. Today, he goes up against the Atlanta Braves. I think I mentioned that I picked him up for the Dynasty team. I uh, I ran him out in the lineup that first start. I was excited about it. We got there. Nice performance. He is absolutely on the bench this week. I am not starting him against the Atlanta Braves. He's a lefty. The Braves have insane right-handed power. Just gargantuan, whatever word you want to choose. They're monster power hitters against the lefty. Um, I still have very little faith in the control and command. He was great the other day. Found a bunch of strikeouts, throws 100 miles an hour, has wicked stuff. But his whole reputation is based on lax command, going to walk a lot of hitters, got to get them in the right spots. Going up against the Braves is not the right spot. You can see all the on-base percentage for the Braves. These guys know how to work a walk. All, right, all the on base that these guys get. Some of that comes from hits, obviously. These guys hit the ball tremendously. I just don't think it's the spot for Garrett Crochet. If he goes out there and blows this team away and strikes out eight guys and pitches six clean innings and gets a win and a quality start, my hat to him and we'll start him in every situation going forward the rest of the year. I don't think we're going to have that problem. They also raised his price, 7600 on FanDuel, 7000 on DraftKings. It's still a appealing sp2 price if it's against you know many other teams just not the spot you've also got rain in the environment it's just not the spot cold night in chicago should help pitching but just not the spot we don't need to argue that much about rostering pitchers against the atlanta braves Ronaldo lopez on the other hand he doesn't project great but he doesn't cost that much he's going up against a really bad white Sox team that is now without Eloy Jimenez. they're down to like one good hitter one and a half if you want to count Andrew Vaughn. So there's at least some upside with kind of a low faith upside play for Ronaldo at price. 7,500 on DraftKings is a little bit higher than I would want to pay for him as an SP2. 65 on FanDuel. If you don't like Javier Assad in the other Chicago game, then Ronaldo Lopez might be more appealing for you. Um, pitched entirely in relief last year. 29.9% strikeout rate is fantastic, but did walk 12.2% in the relief roll. 3.27 ERA, a 4.06 XFIP. This is the more honest number, and I expect this goes up, this comes down in a starting roll. This, not sure, but not really a lot of you know reason to believe that it comes down all that much. The home runs, the power, you know, the home runs will be up or down, no real telling, but he did give up a fair barrel rate last year at 9.4%. Was reasonable on the exit VLO. The hard hits were very good, but the barrels are a little bit concerning in a starting role where he's going to you know, tax his arm a little bit more, be pitching in the fifth inning against the guy for the third time through the road, through the lineup. It's a little bit more concerning. He was much better limiting home runs, limiting barrels, limiting power, limiting everything the year before in 65 and a third, one start, mostly bullpen work, 57 and two thirds before that, nine starts, a 3.43 ERA, 3.77 XFIP. I think this is like around where you can expect the strikeout rate to fall in. Granted, it's exactly the same those two years, but I think we're talking about maybe a dip to like 25% strikeouts. If you could get back to these walk rates in a starting role, um, the Braves might have something. 
But the plan is basically see what he gives you in the starting role and probably going to get him back into the bullpen at some point during the season. They're just a little bit thin on pitching right now. Um, but if he shines, you know, he'll he'll take a role. He's a former very high-end prospect. Came up with the Nats, got traded to this White Sox team. Um, had his best starting season back in like 2019, I want to say. Um, but really has never become the guy that he was supposed to be. But there's definitely some strikeout ability there. And again, just going up against a bad White Sox lineup. Benintendi, Moncada, not great off the top. Moncada may be an average player. 357 plate appearances, 11 home runs. He never fulfilled his promise either. Benintendi is a slap hitter with a little bit of speed. Gets on base at a 326 clip last year. Not nearly enough to be any kind of threat. Was 13% worse than average for run creation. They've got one really good player. Luis Robert Jr. 5200 on DraftKings. Probably a little cheap for him. 3300 on FanDuel. Cheap. Hit 38 home runs, stole 20 bases last year. But both sides kind of got it right because he's got no help around him. So maybe he's a one-off against Ronaldo here, but there's not a lot of upside to go to White Sox stacks. Gavin Sheets is a lefty. You at least get that. Doesn't strike out a ton, but went 203, 267, 331 last year. 61 WRC+, 10 home runs and 344. Andrew Vaughn's got good power, good uh, hard hit rate last year at 46.5%. That only turned into 21 home runs. 258, 314, 429 over 615 plate appearances. 171 ISO, 103 WRC+. They need more from Andrew Vaughn. They're expecting more from Andrew Vaughn, but hasn't really materialized yet. He's been all right, but this isn't a star. This isn't a reason to believe in this team today. Shoemake, no. Fletcher, no. Nicky Lopez, no. Martin Maldonado, maybe you get that weird low-owned off, off-brand catcher home run from him. Or I guess that's on-brand for him. Off-brand catcher selection for only 2300 from the nine spot in the lineup, but it's not an appealing play. So I'm not going to go over the moon for the Lopez shares. I don't really know what the depth looks like. I'm not crazy about it. I prefer the Assad play. But I do think it's there. I think there's reason to believe that he could succeed in this spot. Maybe finds a good number of strikeouts against a bad team. At worst, you know, maybe gets five innings and a win. I definitely think that the Braves are going to pound Garrett Crochet, like I said. At the very least, draw some walks and maybe somebody homers. The thing about Crochet that is interesting, I forgot to mention it when I was talking about him briefly a minute ago. Um, in his limited experience in the in the show, he's been very good at limiting homers. So the Braves are cut down a little bit from where they typically are in terms of the home run model. But I kind of think we're dealing small sample there and the Braves are going to change that sample size real quick. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what those numbers look like tomorrow. Um, but look at all those home runs for the Braves. Look at all these righties, switch hitter. Um, so Ronnie Acuna, big yes if you can afford him in basically any situation, and particularly here leading off, 4,500, 6,500, very, very expensive, very worth it. 41 homers, 73 steals last year. Ozzy Albi is one of my favorite second basemen in the league, hits for a ton of power, also stole 13 bases last year, creator runs 24% better than average. Austin Riley, member of the Dynasty team, long-standing member of the Dynasty team, 37 homers last year, 38 the year before, premium power bat at third base. He's one of the reasons I don't like taking discount guys at third base because you have stars and power hitters, extreme power hitters like him at third base. Matt Olson's same thing at first base. 54 home runs last year, 283, 389, 604. Tremendous, tremendous season for Matt Olson. He doesn't strike out a ton, draws a ton of walks, gets himself on first base when he's not hitting home runs. It's just ridiculous. Marcelo Zuna, Adam Duvall, for a lot of other teams, would be hitting in these two spots. Ridiculous power. Ozuna, 40 home runs from the right side last year in 592, had a 285 ISO. Came into the season with you know, question marks as to whether he'd be worthwhile at all. Monster season. 21 home runs in 353 for Adam Duvall in a part-time role last year. Travis Darno filling in for Sean Murphy, uh, most likely. When you might get Chadwick Trump, but I expect Darno to be the regular guy. 3,600. On DraftKings, where you need catchers, definitely in play for catcher shares for me. 42.8%. 2,600, I would roll him out on FanDuel if I needed a cheap bat in the Braves lineup. I prefer to grab, like, Michael Harris if I've got the 33. I prefer to grab Marcelo Zuna if, I need, if I've got 31. Probably Duvall at the same price. But Darno's on the board for power. 
11 home runs and 292 plate appearances last year, a 9% power rate, 42.8% hard hits. He is one of the better hitting backup catchers in all of baseball and could start for a bunch of teams. He's like 35 now, kind of seems content to be a backup, um, but whenever he's in the lineup, you can absolutely go there. Orlando Garcia at the bottom of the lineup, only 3,300 on DraftKings at shortstop, kind of underappreciated. Somebody's got to be cheap on this team, and it's always going to be Garcia in the bottom, uh, in the ninth spot. But 40.9% hard hit rate last year. Struck out just 19.1%. Hit 17 home runs last year. Everybody on this team hit a ton of home runs last year. Garcia's included in that. Yeah, he was 1% below average for run creation. The ISO is not great, but the counting stats, the ability to maybe get on base and wrap around, it's not a good on base percentage, but it's not tragic. It's not one of these 280 guys. So maybe you get a little bit of bonus from him going back around for a very cheap price. So one to nine lineup on every day. Hunter, absolutely. Crochet was nasty against uh, the Tigers on opening day. We loved them that day. Loved them. He's on again and again. He's on the dynasty team. He got a start that day. Was my only starter on opening day. In fact, on the uh, on the on the dynasty team. But uh, this week he's on the bench. In a week where I'm short on pitching because I also had. Uh, couple of the rays who have uh texas and maybe texas and somebody good um i had peppy it's texas and colorado and at colorado because i had pepio and i have uh that doesn't matter uh savali as a pickup they're both on the bench this year this week so i could have used crochet if i thought he was any chance of being that nasty against this braves team i just have way too much respect for this braves team top of the board for uh for fantasy points among the top of the board even with the cut rates for home runs and i believe that the cut rates in the model are the model showing us what garrett crochet has been not necessarily what he will be tonight um i think the braves have equal upside that they typically do for power so braves bats big yes Ronaldo Ronaldo Lopez uh, for a discount, yes, but not as enthusiastically as Javier Assad. Nothing about the White Sox is appealing, except for maybe some Luis Robert one-offs um, against Ronaldo. We will see if Bo Bichette returns to the lineup today. Not sure if we've gotten any new lineups. Let me take a quick look. uh oh all right we did get that oh no we had the white Sox already uh rangers is out astros is out astros looks like the usual configuration altuve alvarez tucker bregman diaz abreu mccormick pena and probably myers oh no sneaky caratini i didn't realize we were missing the catcher so diaz gets the dh spot today and uh, caratini goes in a catcher in the ninth spot but diaz giner diaz still in the lineup hitting fifth that's all that really matters for our purposes. That's for, oh, the Astros are, are fortunately on the screen. Look at that. So uh, no Jake Myers, as I was saying. Diaz still there. Uh, no McCormick either. Oh, no, McCormick's in there. Sorry. Everything about this lineup is exactly the same except for that last spot, which is Victor Caratini. And that doesn't really matter. Good, decent, okay kind of a pitching matchup here. I greatly prefer Framber Valdez to Jose Barrios. I think Barrios is mostly a league average-ish kind of a starter, like slightly a little bit above league average. I think his talent is overhyped uh, in some discussions. I think his price is way too high at 9700 on the FanDuel slate. 7700 on DraftKings is very, very affordable, but it's a brutal matchup against a very good Astros team. So I don't really like Jose Barrios on this one. I do think you could get away with some some shots, uh, given the very cheap price on DraftKings for his upside. Like that's a good price for if he is just a league average starter. And, you know, we've succeeded with him in the past. I do think he's got a little bit more juice than league average. This was his best season by far. 26.1% strikeout rate, 3.52 ERA, 3.59 xFIP, an excellent whip, was good at limiting power. He dipped the next year down to 19.8% strikeouts, was much more human at 5.23 ERA, 4.21 xFIP, and kind of in between the next year, 23.5% strikeout rate, bit of a bounce back. The ERA and the uh, whip and the xFIP were a little bit better, but he's a gettable starter for a team as good as this Astros team is doesn't really make me want to go running out to roster him even at 7700 it's not quite a good sp2 price it's not quite a i mean it is a discounted sp1 if you want to consider him that but i don't know that i qualify him as that on this pitching slate with all these with some pretty good options 
Fromber, on the other hand, I think at 85, going up against the Blue Jays, particularly if Bo Bichette's out of the lineup again. We just saw this team get no hit last night by Ronald Blanco. Fromber Valdez is a better pitcher, I'm comfortable saying that, than Ronald Blanco is um, by probably a pretty wide margin. Fromber last year, 3-4-5 ERA, 3-3-9 XFIP, another terrific season, 24.8% strikeout rate. He had a few games where he was more gettable than he's been in the past. A couple of blow-up spots, but for the most part was terrific again and very good at limiting power. He gets a little bit of hard hit, but it's all on the ground. 4.2 degree average launch angle. That was actually way up over the last couple of years. Negative 3.6 in 2022, negative 5.5 in 2021 a 2.1% home run rate, a 1.3%. The change in launch angle resulted in it going up to 2.35% last year. Still very difficult to hit home runs against Framber Valdez. Also find strikeouts, got up to 24.8 last year. Was it 23.5 the year before that, 21.9 the year before that, uh, and had a higher mark uh, in a previous season. So really like the upside for Framber. I think he's underpriced on DraftKings. I think you can consider him an absolute SP1 over there for only 85 it's a great option. 91 on FanDuel on a day when Jose Barrios is 97 against the Astros. 9,100 for Framber Valdez against the Blue Jays is definitely a discount. So I really like Framber here. Um, strong consideration for uh, my, my main lineup. On the Blue Jays side, if you do get Bo Bichette back, it's obviously a big boost to this lineup. What you like about the Blue Jays is the very low strikeout rates at the top end of the lineup. When you include Alejandro Kirk at 10.7% last year, 10.7% the year before, that average for those first five hitters is just a 16.1% strikeout rate. If anything's going to limit Fromber, it's probably not like the power or a bunch of run scoring coming from this Toronto team. It's a lack of strikeout upside. They also draw some walks. They do have a little bit of mid-range pop. Vladdy Guerrero should have better than mid-range. George Springer also should have better than mid-range. 30-plus home run upside from both of those guys. But last year, they were only at 21 and 26. They were both well under 200 ISOs. Still created runs better than average, but down seasons for both of those guys last year. Bichette was good, but didn't hit for a ton of power. 20 home runs. His triple slash was good. He created runs really well, but only 20 homers. 23 homers from Justin Turner. Terrific triple slash, as usual. A lot of on-base, a lot of hit tool. Only 4,600. By the way, thanks to us calling for it, I'm going to give Roto Scouts full credit. Not me, you guys, all of us. I'm sure you were writing letters and calling your congressman about it, but we've got third base eligibility on Justin Turner now on DraftKings. Huzzah, huzzah. So now you can play him alongside Vladdy Guerrero. You get Vladdy at first, you get Justin Turner at third. You, you got a nice little stack going off the top if you choose to roster this team. I just hate the upside for him. You can see what uh, Fromber does to the home run upside. And again, they just got no hit. They're, they're kind of in shambles, and it's a very top-heavy lineup. David Schneider against a, uh, a mortal lefty, kind of like for home run upside. He mashed last year, 17.8% barrel, 38.4% well, hard hits. It's low, but 17.8% barrel is killer. 141 plate appearances, eight home runs, 276, 404, 603, 176 WRC plus in the tiny sample. But it's very difficult to hit home runs against Framber Valdez. Against a different lefty, this would probably be over 10. Dalton Varsho, Ernie Clement. Isaiah Conner Falefa, it's weak from even Alejandro Kirk is not great. He doesn't strike out much, but he doesn't do a whole lot else. 250, 334, 358 was below average for runs, 108 ISO, eight home runs last year. This team probably wishes they still had Gabriel Moreno. So, you know, it's it's really a four man stack, and if Bush if Bobichette doesn't play, it's a three man stack against Fromber. It's not appealing. The Astros against Jose Barrios, I'll say it again. I do think there's stacking appeal there. Barrios is gettable, especially with this team. Jose Altuve, 17 home runs, 14 steals in a partial season, 410 plate appearances last year. Remains a superstar at second base until further notice. This team's also super low strikeout. Top five hitters for this team who are a significantly better group of hitters than those guys, 16.2% strikeout rate, higher walk rate on the average. Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tucker, two of the best left-handed hitters in baseball, full stop. Also two of the best left-handed power hitters in baseball. Tucker also stole 30 bases last year. I picked the wrong one for the home run yesterday. I had Alvarez in the model. The model likes Alvarez a little bit better. He's like the only guy from the Astros that didn't home run yesterday. Tucker hit two. Diaz hit two. Everybody had a day. Jordan came in with like six points. It was one of the pieces I did not have right yesterday. That killed me. 
Jordan has a day, I probably take down the FanDuel tournament. But, well, nah, he was popular. Maybe not. But we're a little bit more even competitive than we already were. Anyway, Alex Bregman, um, very low strikeout rate, good walk rate, still a lot of power in that bat from the right side. 25 home runs in 724 plate appearances. Not the crazy elite output that he used to have. Only a 178 ISO, but I still like the ability to get back to a 30 home run season over a 200 ISO over a full campaign this year. And he's only 4,800, 3,100. He's seen a price dip for the you know, perceived underperformance last year. He was still very good on the on the whole last year. Still created runs 25% better than average. Jainer Diaz, I can't talk about enough. I was hammering it yesterday during the show. He's only 3,300. Top catcher one-off option on the board at 3,300. And he's right back at that price again today after homering twice yesterday. He's 2700 on FanDuel. I would absolutely roll him out in Astro Stacks on FanDuel, just like if he was well, he's a DH today. So don't even consider him a catcher. Just play him a catcher. Last year, he made 377 plate appearances as a rookie, hit 23 home runs, and a triple slash of 282, 308, 538. Creator runs 27% better than average and had a 256 ISO in a respectable sample. It's not like it was 100 and change plate appearances. He barreled the ball 12.2% of the time last year, 43.9% hard hit rate. Struck out less than 20% of the time. Needs to learn to draw some walks and push the on-base percentage up, and then he becomes even better. But he is too cheap again, and it's a gettable spot. He's obviously going up against a more talented pitcher today. They had a nothing starter. I don't even remember. Bowden Francis, I think. But it's a, it's a good spot again at 3,300. Jose Abreu, mostly dead, but... Could show signs of life on any given slate. 4,100, 2,500. At least he's cheap at first base, uh, especially if you're stretching to a five-man here. He's playable. Chas McCormick in that spot. 4,200, 2,900. Too cheap for McCormick's upside. 11.1% barrel. 22 homers, 19 steals in 457 last year. Love the upside on any given slate for Chas McCormick. Pena's playable. And then, uh, again, it's, uh, who did I say? Casali in that spot. Kind of an afterthought. You don't really have to worry about that. That is who I said is there, right? Let me at least confirm that. Oh, it's Victor Caratini. Why am I saying Kirk Casale? <laughs> is Kirk Casale even in the league anymore? When did that guy play? Weird name to have pop in my head. There's Caratini if you want to see him. Switch hitter. The reason I wanted to pop him in is he does have a little bit of a good hard hit rate from last year. 44.7% last year. 43.5% the year before. I was remembering that. Seven home runs in 226 last year. Nine home runs in 314 the year before. Ugly triple slash numbers that year, but 259, 327, 383 last year. There's playability in Caratini if you want to get cute. Just consider it like the old uh, Martin Maldonado spot on this Astros team. So Astros top to bottom, I think, are playable against Barrios. Framber big yes. Astros moderate size yes. Barrios playable on DraftKings. Wouldn't touch him at 97 on the FanDuel slate. Blue Jays, I don't really think I want to go there. I, I'm not saying they're going to get no hit again, but um, I don't see a lot of upside against Fromber. Yanks are a tough one today. It's an interesting case for the Yanks. Let me say hi to some people in the chat. We've got people chatting in here. Kenny Woodhouse is here. What's going on, buddy? Good to see you. Stephen Leibowitz saying, I was hoping Caratini was real cheap on DK as a low price. Not terrible bat, but not at 2900 Yeah, I mean, 29 is cheap, but... If I'm spending 29, I'd rather just take Jainer Diaz for 33, figure out how to pay for it. I realize I'm like hunching and like the mic's down here, but I'm like off camera when I do that. Lazy mofos, you're, what's going on, buddy? Michael Knack's loving Bayo tonight on FanDuel. Ooh, so am I, buddy. Yeah, tough decision point for me. I'm trying to decide if I want to go to Assad and go real cheap in the main lineup, or if I want to go with Bayo, who's going to be popular against that Oakland team. If I want to go with Fromber in a pretty good looking spot here. So a lot of options. Tough to see. I'm gonna obviously run it through the tools and see what happens. Speaking of tools, acemine.io, our sim partners. I gotta find some time to get the tools up and running for use on the show and for use on the site. But we're gonna replace the top stacks tool with some percentages from Sims. Acemine.io, the MLB tools are up and running. They've got NBA still going, they've got MMA. A lot of different sports going on over there. First three days at Ace Mind are free. 
You just go over to acemind.io, create yourself a little account. They give a free free three day trial, and then if you subscribe, if you use promo code RotoScouts, all caps, gives you twenty percent off your first month on top of the three days. It's a pretty good little deal there. They've got an optimizer. They've got sims for all those different sports. And there's some good dudes who hang out in the chat a lot of the time. Some of you know them. So support those guys. Help support Roto Scouts a little bit. Right now, everything on Roto Scouts is free. Projections are up. Pitcher projections are up. Home run picks are up. Top stacks. Power index. Full write-up for every game on the slate. Michael Mack just doesn't think that Cubs game plays. Yeah, that's the issue. Like I said, uh, Roth did lower the uh, probabilities of it getting rained out. So that's a plus. But yeah, you do you do roll the dice a little bit there, and um, you know if you get the delay stop start for an hour or whatever, then kills your potential of the uh, pitcher filling out the whole game. Money Crockett, shout out back to you, buddy. Good to see you. Bob Jones loves uh, some attitude. I'm not sure which. He also subscribed and liked the video. Love that, buddy. Thank you very much. Subscribing here is important. I'd say more important than liking the video just so that you guys can get back here next time because these shows, let's face it, they're a little bit variable time-wise. I'd love to get it to like 3 o'clock on the average, but uh, I keep starting the article a little bit too late and I want to complete the article every day. So we'll see what we do going forward over the season, though. But it seems like a good time for everybody. A bunch of people here hanging out each day. So really appreciate it, though. I think that covers most people. Let's see. Jim Thomas is here. Jim Thomas says 15 minutes covering one game that probably won't play. Jim Thomas, uh, that's the approach here, man. <laughs> These are long shows. That's what we do. There are other places that will breeze right through any game you want. We take a different tack here. I appreciate the feedback, though. Anyway, the Yankees and the Diamondbacks are playing tonight. The Yankees are going up against Zach Gallen. The other, so the analysis you would get elsewhere is the Yankees are going up against Zach Gallen, and he's really good. Uh, he's 9,500, and he looks pretty good. You want to play him probably against these Yankees who, you know, they strike out too much, always trying to hit home runs, and uh, you don't want to play these Yankees against him. So uh, no Yankees. Zach Gallen, there's your game. Right? Is that really what we're looking for? Come on. Zach Gallen is really good. Zach Gallen had a 26% strikeout rate. That's good. It's not totally crazy elite. But it's very, very good. 3.47 ERA, 3.49 XFIP last year, a 5.6% walk rate. He did allow a little bit of premium contact. If you look down there, 9.2% barrels last year, 91.5 miles an hour of exit velo, 46% hard hits. He's okay at keeping the ball down. It's more line drive, fly out kind of trajectory than home run trajectory on the average at 12.3 degrees. But I know a team that has a bunch of guys who know how to elevate and hit home runs. Only a 2.60% home run rate, but that does mean that there were some home runs gettable against him last year. He was good at it, good at limiting him the year before as well. Barrels were at 7.8%. That's better than 9.2. The launch angle was further down than it was against uh, than it was last year. Resulted in a 2.10%. And again, home runs very, very wonky, uh, wonky year to year. The year before that, 3.63% home run rate with basically matching numbers. 12.3 degree average launch, 7.9% barrel rate. So you put this barrel rate even against that launch, and this year it resulted in a 3.63% home run rate in his 121 and a third innings over 23 starts. So I do think as good as Zach Gallen is, and he's improved since that year. I mean, we're not talking about the same pitcher anymore. But it shows how home runs can be a little bit tricky, and his contact profile hasn't really improved that much despite improvement elsewhere in his game. So if you're picking one team... It's got some upside to beat Zach Gallen on any given slate. The Yanks are definitely on that list. I don't know that it's a good stacking spot. I think it's more likely to be a couple of runs. Gallen has a decent day, finds a few strikeouts. But he's not at the top of the board. He's not even over a 30 FanDuel projection. He's not off the top of the board by that much. But I prefer all of these guys. I prefer the discount on Assad. Do I want Zach Gallen against the Yankees at 95 or Jose Barrios against the Astros at 97? There, I would probably opt for Gallen. But on DraftKings, 7,700, 9,100, that's a no-brainer. You take Barrios. You Darvish against St. Louis is arguably in that same conversation, as is Logan Webb against the Dodgers, also a brutal matchup for a very good pitcher. 
So I don't think that Gallon is necessarily like a you know easy to click on ace caliber pitcher against any given team. I think it's a potentially somewhat dangerous spot for Zach Gallon here. 95 price is fine. 91 price is fine on DraftKings, but uh, I don't love it. I'm not going to really go to it. Um, could easily succeed. No doubt about it. There are strikeouts to be found against the Yankees. There are also some guys who are very, very good at limiting strikeouts. They added Juan Soto to that group this year. Soto, 18.2% strikeouts, 18.6% walks last year, a 410 on base percentage, 35 home runs. Now he's hitting in front of Aaron Judge. In a partial season last year, Aaron Judge hit 37 home runs, got on base at a 406 clip. Yeah, he strikes out, 28.4% strikeout rate, but he also walks, 19.2% walks. Glaber Torres, just 14.6% strikeouts last year, 10% walks. Rizzo, 23% strikeouts. The walks are lower than his teammates. Stanton, even John Carlos Stanton, draws about 10% walks. Strikes out about 30% of the time, can't hit for average. He's had off to a decent start for the season. Still hits everything very, very hard when he manages to make contact. He's only 4,800, 3,000. Alex Verdugo for 4,000, 2,700 across sites. Anthony Volpe at 3,800, 2,800. If you're just getting last year's counting stats from Anthony Volpe is too cheap. And everything about how he's approaching the, the each plate appearance is different than it was last year. It's gotten me a little bit renewed excitement about Anthony Volpe's upside. I was really sour on him last year um, after, you know, with his just tremendous uppercut hacks trying to hit home runs on every pitch. Austin Wells, I like the upside for the young catcher from the left side. A little bit of power there. You can see the premium contact numbers. Oswaldo Cabrera has been like the best player in baseball over the first week. <laughs> Won't stop. Drove in another run yesterday. Won't stop hitting little dink singles that drop into the outfield and score runs, and then he scores. Anyway. The point of that entire rant was um, I do think you can loosely play some Yankee stacks. I wouldn't consider them top of the board. Like they're, I think they're fourth ranked despite projecting, you know, very well again. Um, I think I ranked them fourth on this slate, but I do think there's a lot of upside there. And if they're low owned, I think there's a lot of potential. You get them into the bullpen uh, after, after gallon here, it's a bullpen that had to get uh, reconfigured after they uh, lost their closer. So they move some pieces around. So it's not as, you know, some of the high leverage guys have to move back a spot. So I think it's a gettable pen. Not a prime spot for Zach Allen. Not a prime spot for Nestor Cortez either. As uh, we talked about at the top of the show, they did lose Corbin Carroll out of the top of this lineup. So that's a big bump for Nestor. He had a messy first two innings against the Astros in his first start, then kind of pulled it together, ended up lasting five, struck out, I think five, gave up a couple of walks, a couple of runs. Um, not a great outing from Nestor, who was not great last year. He was kind of back to old Nestor Cortez last year where 63 and a third, before he got hurt anyway, uh, 12 starts, 63 and a third, 25.2% strikeout rate is perfectly fine, but went back up to a 4.97 ERA, and there was no hiding that in the 4.84 XFIP. It just kind of is who he was. He was giving up a little bit of power, 4.14% home runs. The contact numbers weren't awful, but there's a lot of launch angle and a lot of that Yankee Stadium style. Um, so in this ballpark, maybe you take that the home run upside with a grain of salt, but there's just a lot of contact, a lot of premium ability in that Diamondbacks lineup, even without Christian uh, Corbin Carroll. And Nestor, I'm not a big believer right now. You know, when he was good, he was getting got by on guile and mixing up his pitches and throwing 10 different pitches and changing his arm angle and doing all sorts of funky stuff and changing the timing of, uh, you know, how quickly he'd go back to releasing the ball uh, between pitches and whole lot of stuff that maybe the pitch clock had an impact last year. There's all sorts of things potentially going on with Nestor, plus the injury last year. There's just too, too much adding up, even at 7,900, 7,300. I don't really consider him an option on this slate. I do think it could lead you to the Diamondbacks. I was just a lot more excited about him when they had Corbin Carroll hitting there. Blaze Alexander, rookie 2,200, 2,900. At least it averages down the price at the top end. Um, but, you know, Ketel Marte, Lourdes Gurriel, Christian Walker, Joanio Suarez, Gabriel Moreno. That would be my prime stack. You know, one and then these four guys. That's really the appeal here. So it does diminish, but not eliminate is the way that I put it on the uh, site update for the Diamondback stack. And it's really those five guys that I would want. Marte, 25 homers last year. Gurriel, 25, uh, bounced back to 24 homers. 261, 309, 463. Maintained a decent triple slash. Christian Walker, I rave about 33 home runs, 11 steals, 239 ISO, 120 WRC+, plus, doesn't strike out all that much, draws walks, very, very good first baseman who's probably underpriced at 5000 on DraftKings. That's too cheap. 
he shouldn't be 200 less than Cattell Marte. He shouldn't be, definitely shouldn't be 100 less than Lourdes Gurriel. 38 on FanDuel, you could argue that he's a $4,000 player. I'll take the discount. 4,400 for Junior Suarez is cheap for all his power upside. 3,200 on FanDuel. Off to a decent start this year. Dipped to 22 home runs last year, but averaged 31 the two years before that. I think it was exactly 31 the two years before that. And then Gabriel Moreno, the guy I was saying before, Toronto probably wishes they still had catching or, or gave the catcher job to, uh, was an elite prospect coming up for them. And then they flipped uh, Gabriel Moreno and Lourdes Gurriel for Dalton Varsho before last season. Uh, both of these guys had better seasons than Varsho did. So that was a mistake. Moreno, 284, 339, 408 last year, 103 WRC plus, seven home runs and 380 plate appearances. Uh, another another just really good player in this lineup. So I like him at catcher, uh, but I still prefer Jainer Diaz for 600 less. Bottom of the lineup, Jorge Barosa, Jake McCarthy, Aroldo Perdomo, nothing really to speak of down there. So Zach Allen is definitely a yes, even at price. It's just not an enthusiastic yes, and it's not a yes that I would take out to bigger shares than any of the guys above him on the board or some of the value plays. So he's at several spots down the list, yes. The Yankees are a yes for me against uh, against Zach Gallen, but a less appealing yes than the Yankees are against a lot of other pitchers. Nestor Cortez, pretty much a no. Diamondbacks, diminished but not eliminated from contention for some stacks across 150 lineups. One of the pitchers that was referred to before, Brian Bale. <laughs> Travis Windham, I love Yiner, but uh, kind of sad he's no longer a secret. I did get him in late in best ball, though. Ah, nice. It's a good spot to have him. Anthony Taylor's planting a flag on Gallon Houston stacks, Arizona on uh, Arizona stack on FanDuel. I'll take my medicine tomorrow. I Again, I am not saying that Zach Gallon couldn't go out and have an absolutely filthy start, put up a 60 on the FanDuel scale, and win the day. He's got that ability, no doubt about it. He is a very, very good pitcher. A lot of the things changed from a couple years ago, but the one thing we were focused on was the contact in there, and that hasn't really changed that much. He just had some happenstance help lower the home run rate, but the guy who gave up those home runs in terms of the contact that he allows is still in there. It's just everything around that in that pitcher got better. Helps hide the contact a little bit. And when he's striking guys out, there's fewer opportunities to hit home runs. So, yes, there's upside for, for Gallon for sure. I'm not telling you not to play him by any stretch. But I don't think he's as elite as he will be in a lot of other spots this year. Brian Bayo might be in the most elite spot he's going to be all season. I think I said that about Tanner Houck last night. Tanner Houck, low 20s strikeout pitcher. Kind of like Brian Bayo at 19.8% last year. I think Bayo's got, actually got better stuff. But Hauk was in a killer spot last night. Didn't expect him to go out and strike out 10 athletics, but he did. Put up a huge score on FanDuel. I think he went six innings, got the win, got the quality start, 10 strikeouts, monster game. We're looking at similar upside for Brian Bayo today. I think he's a little bit higher priced than we had Hauk yesterday. 88 on FanDuel, 8,000 on DraftKings. But again, I do think he's got better stuff. He's got a big fastball. Got developing secondary offerings. I think his strikeout rate goes up. I like him, you know, maybe 23, 24% for the year this year, somewhere in that neighborhood. 10.7% swinging last year kind of supports that. What Bayo does similarly to Tanner Houck is he keeps the ball down. Very, very good at inducing ground balls. Just a 4.9% uh, launch angle last year, 7% barrel rate allowed. So we don't really sweat the hard hits. We don't really sweat the exit velo as much. He did give up a 3.59% home run rate. Four is, you know, the, the, the tragic number. 3.59 is a little bit aggressively higher than we would want it to be. But again, some happenstance baked into that, especially when these numbers are as low as they are. And he sustained that going back in time. 5.3 degrees, 5.4% barrel in 57 and a third 11 starts in 2022. And you can see the difference in the home run rate, right? These are not that far off. In fact, it's a higher launch angle, slightly fewer barrels, and it was a 0.37% home run rate in 11 starts, 57 innings. Not a huge sample. If you had pitched more that year, you would have given up more home runs, but the percentage over those 11 starts is fantastic. So you, it's a distinct difference despite similar contact. So I like his ability to keep the ball down, and like I said yesterday about Tanner Houck in the sa against the same team, if you're not allowing this Oakland team to hit many home runs, they don't really do anything else. 
That's really all they can do is a couple of decent home run hitters. So there are not many threats here. I love the spot for Bayo. And he's kind of in the middle price-wise. He's not a total discount like Assad. He's not at the top of the board like Jose Barrios or somebody. Just a really, really good spot. We're going to be targeting this athletics team all year long, just so you guys know. That's not a new theme. <laughs> also, the athletics are doing some weird stuff. Uh, Brent Rooker's been out of the lineup the last few days. They sent down Esther Ruiz. There's a lot of rumors going around that it's because these guys are voicing support for the fans against ownership in the whole, you know, moving the team and getting out of Oakland controversy and all of that. Who knows if that's true? What matters is Estoy is not on the team anymore. Brent Rooker hasn't been in the lineup. That takes one of their power bats out of the equation. You guys know I don't like Brent Rooker, but at a certain point, like I was saying through the year last year, his price gets low enough that you buy the dip and the you know the return to a few home runs and you buy him sneaky. At 27.42, I think he's very low priced in this spot. It's just not a good home run opportunity. If he's not in the lineup, he's obviously not hitting any home runs. He's very cheap, though, for a guy who did hit 30 home runs last year. The reason I don't like him is there's a lot of swing and miss in his profile, and I'm not talking about a high strikeout rate. I'm talking about a strikeout rate that was 32.7% last year and could be higher and could cause him problems. He's not a good hitter overall. He's just a decent power bat when he gets bat on ball. There's a lot of pitches where he swings and misses, and if he misses just a few of these batted ball events, everything drops precipitously. So that's why I don't like Brent Rooker overall, but I'll take him when he when he's cheap and unpopular. This isn't the spot to do that, though, not against a pitcher who keeps the ball down that much. Ryan Nota, J.J. Bleday off the top, a little bit of on-base skill. I don't mind those lefties against other righties, but I don't love them in this spot. Zach Geloff is their only good player, 2,800, 4,700. He's underpriced. He would make a somewhat interesting one-off at second base if anybody around him was good to help support him if he gets to first. Stole 14 bases, hit 14 home runs in just 300 plate appearances, but with no real help from his friends, I don't love it as a one-off. He is correctly priced for that, but not a lot of help. Seth Brown, lefty with a little bit of home run upside, kind of along the Brent Rooker lines. J.D. Davis, I do like. I think there's a ton of premium contact, and one of these years it's going to all come together. Hit 18 home runs last year, had a dip in the contact profile like we've highlighted already. Shea Langoliers still makes a ton of premium contact, but he's bad at everything else. Did hit 22 sneaky cheap home runs for 40 in 400, 490 plate appearances, but 205, 268 is tragic on the front end of the triple slash. Lawrence Butler, Nick Allen at the bottom of the lineup, and no thanks. Just feeds the appeal for Bra for Brian Bayo. Alex Wood going up against the Red Sox. I don't think there's much reason to roster Alex Wood, even for the discount 6,000, 6,400. I don't really see it. Just a 17.2% strikeout rate, a 4.33 ERA, and a 5.14 xFIP in 12 starts, 97 and two thirds last year. Just a 2.10% home run rate was good at limiting barrels and launch angle, but there's no real appeal in that low strikeout rate. Was better for strikeouts a couple years ago, 23.6% in 2022, 26% in 2021 was good, but never an elite pitcher. And I think it's a decent Red Sox team, even with some of the lefties in there. I went through the lefties in the article that's up on the site. Um, some of them lose a little bit of power upside, but especially Devers, Yoshida, and Tristan Casas are all still pretty good lefty-lefty. And this is a non-threatening lefty. So I don't mind at all going to Red Sox here. And I think if they're going to be under-owned against Alex Wood, it's kind of an interesting spot because you do still have some very good righties. You've got an underappreciated Trevor Story for very, very cheap. He didn't completely go off yesterday, but he had a decent score. I forget what it was, and I forget what his line was. But for only 4,200, 2,800, right-handed shortstop going up against Wood, I think he can go back there. Jaron Duran um, wasn't as good against lefties last year, but not a huge dip. It's on Again, it's on the site in the strategy article if you want to check it out. Don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, Duran's also already stolen five bases this year. Just wheels if he gets on uh, if he gets on base. He created runs 20% better than average in his 362 plate appearances last year. Very good leadoff option. Devers, really no dip against the against the lefty, especially not a lefty like this. Monster power numbers, 33 home runs last year, 229 ISO. Took a little bit of a haircut in his uh, triple slash overall year over year, but love him to get back to quality. Tyler O'Neill, power and sneaky speed. We saw the uh, numbers from two years ago uh, on basically every show where Tyler O'Neill's been on the slate so far. I won't scroll over for him again, but I love the price, 4300 3200 Another member of the Dynasty team. Just need five, five, 600 plate appearances from you this year, Tyler. 
Masataki Yoshida, no real dip at all against lefties. Very good overall hitter, more of a line drive guy than a power guy, but a really interesting bat at 4,100, 2,900, especially lefty-lefty here. I don't really sweat it. If he gets unpopular there, I think that's kind of uh, a good reason to look at him. So then Rafaela, young prospect for them, 4,000, 2,500, third base eligibility, but you don't play him over Devers on FanDuel, so it matters less, but only 2,500, a lot of skill there. 241, 281, 386, doesn't really matter. 74 WRC plus across his 89 plate appearances last year doesn't really matter. Hit two home runs and three stolen bases in that tiny cup of coffee, so a little something there. And the the team likes him a lot. He's organizationally one of their top overall prospects. Casas was one of their top prospects. Now he's their full-fledged first baseman. 24 home runs last year and 502 plate appearances. Tons of premium contact. Only 4,700 on DraftKings. I like him. Get Tristan Casas while he's below 5,000 because that isn't going to last long. 3,100 on the FanDuel slate. Get him while he's cheap over there too. Pablo Reyes, Connor Wong, if that's who's rounding out the lineup. Connor Wong, a little bit of premium contact. Nine home runs and 403 plate appearances last year. And I thought there was another season where there were some home runs, but I guess not. So it was really just those uh, scatter shot home runs last year. But always cheap. Bottom of the Red Sox lineup. So no love for anything athletics at all. Big yes for Bayo. And a pretty pretty enthusiastic yes, if the especially if the Sox are low-owned. I think it's kind of an interesting spot. The ballpark doesn't really help. There are a bunch of lefties. We'll see what ends up in the lineup. Like, we could easily get a um, Bobby Dahlbeck day instead of Tristan Casas. Maybe they give Casas a blow, let Dahlbeck start, play first base. Uh, if that's the case, I, you guys know I love Bobby Dahlbeck. I would actually almost prefer that. I'd love to get him in there like a DH in this game. There's also the chance that, um, you know, maybe we lose Yoshida or somebody uh, somebody else, Jaron Duran. Uh, to a Rob Refsnyder start. They love throwing Robbie Refsnyder in there against the lefty. So keep an eye on the Red Sox lineup, but if it's anywhere near this form, I, at the very least, yes, 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 and yes. I suppose I could have just said one through seven or highlighted those guys. So any of those guys that are in the lineup, I like. Bobby Dahlbeck, I would like. Refsnyder does hit lefties well. The thing is, he's not driving the ball. He's not hitting for power. He's just getting on base to set the table. So if he's here, you can play him in stacks. If he's down here... Kind of an afterthought. <laughs> he should grow up and call himself Robert Dahlbeck. <laughs> they might let him be on the team for the full season if he does that. I like it. Yeah, if it's good enough for Bobby Axelrod, though, I think he can still, still go with Bobby Dahlbeck. Do you guys watch Billions? It's a good show. It was silly. It was nothing like the real world. Or maybe it was exactly like the real world for those people. Who the hell knows? But it was a fun show. And anything Giamatti is always good. I love that they brought back John Malkovich in the uh, Russian oligarch role. <laughs> the, the He's not Teddy KGB. Don't call him that. But he's Teddy KGB. Kind of a role. Pretty great. Guardians, Mariners, best pitching matchup on the slate. Shane Bieber is way too cheap at 8,800 on DraftKings. I'll say that out of the gate. Luis Castillo priced appropriately. Tons of upside for Castillo, um, an established good high strikeout starter. The question mark with Bieber is you know 20.1% strikeouts last year. What do we get? His first start was against Oakland. He struck out, I think, 10, 11. I want to say it's 11. Struck out a ton in his first start. It was kind of back to... Shane Bieber of old, 25% strikeout rate across 200 innings in 31 starts in 2022, only made 21 starts, 128 innings coming back from injury in uh, 2023, 96 and two thirds and 16 starts in 2021, he was at a 33.1% strikeout rate. The truth is probably around this number with upside for more, if all goes well for Shane Bieber. I think the Mariners are an interesting test here. We talked about it with Tristan McKenzie yesterday. This team does have home run power. They've got plenty of premium contact through the lineup. They had good run creation marks last year. I'm not entirely sure that this is an overly good baseball team. On the wrong night, there's so much strikeout in this lineup. There are so many holes in this lineup, potentially. For DFS purposes, you've got a lot of nights where there are two catchers in the DraftKings lineup. 
That can be a good thing if you're desperate for a catcher with power. Both of those guys hit for power, but you can't play them together in stacks. It's a limiting factor in stacks. Mitch is a huge question mark. What can he what can he bring to the table this year? He's only made 229 plate appearances last year and 300 something, 247 the year before. 17 combined home runs across the two seasons. A couple years ago, 39 home runs. Which guy is he? He strikes out a ton too. A lot of strikeouts through the heart of this lineup. Even Julio strikes out at a fairly aggressive rate without walking a ton. He's just a superstar. 32 home runs, 37 stolen bases. J.P. Crawford gets on in a very good clip ahead of Julio. I like that one too. I think Jorge Polanco still has something left. Pretty good barrel rate last year. Resulted in 14 home runs in his 343 plate appearances. He's just never, ever healthy. While you can get him, I think he's a reasonable third man in. One, two, three off the top. Maybe you go one of the catchers and Mitch. But there's a lot of strikeout. I think there's a lot of upside for Shane Bieber without being too threatened. Bieber's another guy reasonably decent at limiting barrels, limiting launch angle, limiting home runs. 7% and change barrel rates each of these two years. 2.63, 2.28% home runs. This year, 9% barrels, but only 2.72% home runs. Again, some happenstance there. Shane Bieber, over time, has been a very good pitcher with upside for more strikeouts than what he gave us last year. Very low walk rates. Oh, that one's more average. This one's really low. That one's pretty low. Always a good swinging strike option. The elite year, 16.2% is ungodly. 13.8% with the dip last year, in, uh, two, two years ago, and uh, I get lost between 2022 and 2023 still. Two years ago with the 25%. And then even last year with the dip to 20% was still above 10%. Still a 29.7% CSW. A lot of strikes against the team that likes to swing and miss. Against the team that likes to strike out. I'll buy the upside for Shane Bieber at 88. He's 10-2 on the FanDuel slate. It's an entirely different proposition over there. But he still lands fairly high up the board. He's not far off the projections for anybody else. You just do have Castillo at the top of the board a couple points separated from everybody. Castillo, 27.3% strikeouts last year, 3.34 ERA, a 3.81 XFIP. A lot, a little bit of pop, 3.49% home runs right on the line at 90 miles an hour of exit velo and 9.4% barrel. You do get the occasional home run to ruin a Luis Castillo, otherwise elite start from time to time. But a lot of times you also get that where he powers through with a bunch of strikeouts and it matters less. Takes the absolute ceiling away uh, that it could have been. Um, but it doesn't always happen to him either. 2.11% this year, 2.37% with very good launch angle and barrel that year. Went up this year and then went way up the, the following year. So is that because he's you know aging a little bit? Is thing, have things changed? Is it just happenstance? We'll find out. That's why they play the games. But given the strikeout upside, even against a low strikeout Cleveland squad, which for them, that's what they do well. Station to station baseball, don't strike out try and get to first base, maybe steal a bag. They don't have a ton of power to threaten him, so I'm not as worried about any kind of home run upside. He can find some strikeouts on the back end for sure. Those last four guys average a 27.7% mark to still push this team to almost 20% despite all these low rates. Those top five guys, 13.1%. Somewhere in the middle, I think we find seven, eight strikeouts against this team. I think we find a pretty good start for Luis Castillo. If he pitches deep into the ball game, we're getting that quality start out of it. We're potentially getting a few more strikeouts. And there's really, outside of Jose Ramirez, a little bit of Andres Jimenez, a little bit of Josh Naylor on the other side, outside of this three-man group, there's really not a lot to be afraid of in that Cleveland lineup. Not if you're Luis Castillo, anyway. If it's me out there pitching, they're probably all going to hit home runs. Esteban Florial. We'll find out whether he's a major leaguer. He's been a quad A player for a long time, but positionally blocked by the Yankees. Brian Ruscio, not much. Bo Naylor, I do think, is an interesting young catcher, but 4,100 when all those other catchers that we really like are in the threes? That doesn't really make sense. 26 on FanDuel, you don't need catchers. Ramon Laureano, Will Brennan, below average players last year. Naylor's good. Jose Ramirez is a star. And Andres Jimenez is maybe a little bit underrated. 15 homers, 30 steals last year. 17 homers, 20 steals the year before former top, top prospect. I do think there's still a little season-long juice for uh, Andres Jimenez, but I love the Luis Castillo side here. Both of these are big yeses to the pitchers and really not that much love for the um, for the bats at all. I wouldn't take 
Guardian stacks, I don't think at all today. Maybe a one-off Jose Ramirez here and there looking for that home run. Maybe you could do the same with uh, Jimenez or, or Josh Naylor if you wanted to. Maybe even Bo Naylor, but I, again, I don't love the price where you need catchers. If I'm taking a stack, it would probably be on the Mariners' side. Try and target the lower strikeout rate or the perception of a lower strikeout rate. But again, I don't love that team. So I'm dealing with J.P. Crawford, Julio, Jorge Polanco, and then probably one of the two Mitches or like uh, Mitch the outfielder and one of the two catchers. Dominic Canzone had a home run yesterday to ruin Tristan McKenzie's day. If he's back in the lineup, a little bit of sneaky premium contact for cheap prices, but not an ideal spot bottom of the lineup. So both pitchers, yes. Neither team really all that much in terms of stacks. 5.03, we're doing all right. Two games to go. If this was yesterday, we would have just finished. Did any games get postponed yet? I'm sure we got more lineups in that I haven't been talking about. No word on postponements or anything, right? I just reload Underdog. Underdog's MLB tweet has been, or uh, Twitter feed has been pretty good. Uh, Braves lineup, Acuna, Albies, Riley, Olsen, Ozuna, Duvall, Harris, Arcia, and Chadwick Trump is in the lineup. Shit. So no uh, Travis Darno today. Again. Maybe maybe Chadwick Trump's going to get more of those plate appearances than I think. I got to I gotta consider that. Uh, Cubbies. Nico, Seiya Suzuki, Cody Bellinger, Chris Morrell, Dansby Swanson, Ian Happ, Garrett Cooper, Nick Madrigal, and Miguel Amaya in at catcher. Uh, so no John Gomes, you get Miguel Amaya. Kind of a swappable part. But otherwise, that lineup is exactly what we talked about. Hang on. Oh, okay. He's on the Phillies now. That threw me. I saw a uh, note from Underdog that uh, Spencer Turnbull was going to throw 80 to 85 pitches, and I was like, he's not on the slate, but he's uh, on Philly now. Minor twist. Um, let's see. Tigers we didn't do yet. Um, looks roughly similar to what we had. Uh, Meadows, Torkelson, Carpenter, Green, love the left. The three lefties in the top four. Like that top four-man group. Uh, Matt Vierling back in the lineup. Colt Keith is in there at second base. I like that. Another lefty. Uh, then Carson Kelly, Gio Urshela, and Zach McKinstry. So some changes to the bottom. But the key players that we talked about with the Tigers that I like, Parker Meadows, Torkelson, um, Kerry Carpenter, Riley Green, and Colt Keith are all in the lineup. So that stays. Just need some weather. Doesn't appear to be raining in Jersey City right now. Which would be a bonus. City Field is, I'm going to say, 10 miles that way. Probably not even. Manhattan's like a mile and a half that way. So Queens is a little bit beyond Manhattan. Cardinals and the Padres. I do think we can go to the Padres here against Miles Michaelis. I would not roster Miles Michaelis against this Padres team. And it's really, it's not even because of the Padres necessarily. It's just, I really wouldn't ro roster Miles Michaelis unless he's facing one of those target teams. Michaelis at home with the Rockies in town. Maybe we go there at a cheap price. Miles, Miles Michaelis in the Coliseum against the Athletics. Maybe we go to Michaelis at a cheap price. In San Diego, decent ballpark for pitchers, but not a good lineup to face. Not a lot of strikeout potential for him. He doesn't walk many, 4.5% walk rate. Very, very good last year, over 201 and a third and 35 starts. Pitches deep into ball games, gives you a lot of starts, kind of an innings eater. But a 4.78 ERA, a 4.76 XFIP under that. Only 7.3% swinging strikes and 25% CSW, resulting in a 15.9% strikeout rate last year. No, thank you. 90.4 miles an hour of exit velo, nearly a 10% barrel rate allowed. Just allows a lot of contact and a lot of good contact. And he's going up against a team with at least a couple stars. And I talked about it yesterday and I wrote about it today. I think with the additions of Luis Camposano coming into his own, Graham Pauly and Jackson Merrill at the bottom of this lineup, this is no longer that San Diego completely top-heavy team that we've dealt with the last few years. I think they're kind of interesting outside of Jerks and Profar and maybe Jake Cronenworth, who continues to probably hit third. I think they're kind of interesting. If they could ever get Pauly or Jackson Merrill going good enough in their rookie years to jump into the third spot and shake up that lineup a little bit. 
that gets even more interesting, but they're deeper than they've been. So really no reason to go to Miles Michaelis. And I think with all that talent and uh, some pretty good prices too, good reasons to go to the Padres here. Get some multi-position guys in there. One of them's Cronenworth, of course, and the other one is uh, Profar. No, Hassan Kim, thankfully. You also get multi-position on Manny, third base and shortstop on DraftKings. Manny Machado for 5,100 with shortstop eligibility is very interesting in this matchup on DraftKings. That's kind of a killer spot. He's a couple hundred bucks shy of where he should be priced. 8.09 in the home run model today. 30 home runs last year, a 204 ISO. A track record of being Manny Machado for his entire career. He's a $4,000 player on FanDuel. That's, a, that's about right. 51 on DraftKings is low. So that's a killer spot, especially when you add the shortstop eligibility. Getting him, you need to play him at third if you want him, Bogarts, and Hassan Kim in the same lineup. Bogey, second base and shortstop. Kim, second base and shortstop. On FanDuel, Bogey still relegated just to shortstop, even though I'm pretty sure he started every game this season at second base. 19 home runs, 19 steals for him last year. Out to a hot start this season. Kim, uh, 17 home runs, 38 steals last year, 112 WRC+. plus. A lot of talent for those guys. Haven't even mentioned Fernando Tatis, 5,700. Totally fine paying that price for uh, Tatis. He should be over 6,000 against Miles Michaelis. Uh, 3,800 is too cheap for him on FanDuel as well, so you're getting a discount on Tatis. Cronenworth, you know, he's he's there, as I finally pieced together as I was talking about it yesterday, just because he's left-handed, and it helps break up that run of righties that they've got. But really, again, miscast as a three-hitter. He should be down here somewhere. If he was any good, he would be hitting here, but he's not. That's why I'm saying I, I hope one of these guys gets good enough that they can promote them up there, move Cronenworth down to here, send Jerks and Profar to some other team, and I think it stretches the Padres even further. I mentioned Campos, Camposano as part of that extension of this lineup. In 174 last year, 319, 356, 491. Creator runs 34% better than average. Hit seven home runs in the tiny sample. A moderate contact profile, but for a catcher, that's still pretty good. Didn't strike out really at all in the tiny sample. And again, look at the strikeouts for this team. That top seven guys, these two are rookies and we have no sample from last year, but the top seven guys, the only guy who struck out more than 20% is Fernando Tatis last year. Everybody else is below 20, the average 17.8%, going up against the guy who struck out 15.9. Are we seeing it yet? I think there's good expectation from the pods here. And Campusano, to round off the point about him, off to a pretty strong start. I put the starts for all three of these guys in the article up on the site. Look for the strategy article. On the card side, going up against you, Darvish. Bad start in the South Korea series. Good start after that. I also put that on the site. Let me. First start was, um, came out after like three and two thirds, I think. The second start for Darvish. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. struck out seven giants just one gave up one run five hits walked just one of 20 hitters only went five in that one i think he gets maybe a little bit more depth maybe has a shot at the uh at the sixth inning here 9300 i don't love it because i still have a healthy respect for this cards lineup we just saw him go off yesterday that's not the reason i have respect for them i just think they're a lot of good players who had kind of down years last year in that lineup but for 8200 on DraftKings, Darvish may be a little bit interesting. If you consider him like a cheap SP2, or maybe you look at it as like, I go 82 for Darvish and 8000 for Bayo, and I pay two like mid-range prices at pitcher rather than going like high-low. If you ever wanted to go Bayo and uh, Assad, you're really saving money though. So I do think there's viability for that. Or you can you can even use Frommer in that role, 85, 82. I think those those guys combine fairly well for a couple of not apex prices. Um, with decent upside. Like Darvish at this price has more upside than Darvish at that price, is what I'm trying to say. But I do like these cards. I do think you can play some cards against Darvish. He's got strikeout stuff, but on the wrong day, he's got a lot of balls in the dirt, walks too many, throws a couple wild pitches, some runs score through happenstance. These guys do have power potential against him. 
So maybe a little sprinkling of cards, maybe a little sprinkling of uh, of Darvish is about the right way to approach it. I like Brendan Donovan again, as long as he's hitting leadoff and uh, fairly priced, especially with triple position eligibility for only 26 on FanDuel, 3,600 on DraftKings. I mentioned a little bit more power last year, gets on base at a very good clip ahead of Goldschmidt, Gorman, and Arenado. All those guys have home run upside, 25, 27, and 26 home runs from those three last year, 122, 118, and 107 WRC plus marks. Wilson Contreras hit a home run last year or last night, 3,800 back at it at catcher, very good contact profile, 12.2% barrels, 46.3% hard hits from him last year, only 2,600 on FanDuel. I think you can deploy him on the FanDuel slate. I had him in some lineups last night, 20 home runs last year, a 203 ISO. He's more than just, you know, a low end catcher. Any catcher that hits like he does, hits in the middle of the lineup, plays almost every day, or, you know, your Adley Rutschmans of the world who typically hit second and do play literally every day. Guys like that, you consider better than the average catcher. So I'm willing to pay a little bit more for them on FanDuel. I'm willing to play them like they're, you know, considered a DH or a second first baseman or whatever. Victor Scott's still the dead minimum at 2,000 with all that speed to burn. Just needs, uh, you know, to get himself to first base. Jordan Walker, 3,900, 2,600. I do like the upside for Walker. He had a good year last year. I've talked about it a few times. Lost his, uh, you know, prospect buzz after getting sent back down came back up and was very very good and just kind of fell by the wayside in conversations going into this year so i hope he has a good year more than liking him to have a good year i kind of hope he does for him just would be a nice story burleson kind of an afterthought mason wink kind of an afterthought so darvish yes if you want him even on fanduel at 93 if you're a believer it's not a bad projection i just think there's better options for the money 82 on DraftKings, I think he's definitely in the mix for some shares, especially if you're looking like mid-mid. I think he's one of the better mid-priced starting pitchers. Miles Michael is gigantic, no. And uh, the Padres stack, yes. I think there's a good reason to roster Padres stack. Strong consideration from me uh, for getting one of those top spots. Last game up. Giants. Dodgers. Dodgers, unless something has changed, let me double check, make sure... Not far as I know. So the uh, Dodgers are going with Michael Grove as probably a multi-inning opener. And then Ryan Yarbrough was the way that I saw it reported. Maybe maybe that's changed. But that's why Grove is projected so, so low. I just gave him like two innings here. Let me Google real quick, actually, make sure. There are no good updates on this. What's up, Pinstripe Pimp? Was that you that posted the note about never realizing that I was a Yankees fan all these years? Despite the hat that I wear every day? <laughs> good to see you, buddy. Appreciate the, uh, the note and the like uh, on a show the other day. Pretty sure that was you. Um... What was I just looking for? Let's just see where. Yeah, I, I think we're dealing with like two innings. That's the read I've got on it. So unless there's news, uh, and I'll scour around a little bit more, but I believe that's what we're dealing with here from Michael Grove, so it takes him off the board. Um, 69 innings last year, 24.2% strikeout rate. But if we're not getting a full start, I don't think he's on the board. What I think it could wreak havoc is if they do make that change and go from uh, Michael Grove, a righty, to Ryan Yarbrough, a lefty, it could wreak havoc on this Giants lineup. Just because of the way this team approaches it with the mix and match platoon approach anyway. Um, I think Jung Ho Lee, probably pretty safe off the top. Lamont Wade, maybe safe, but if he comes up in the wrong spot, I do think you could maybe get Wilmer to pinch it in that spot and just jump in at first base. Conforto, Jastrzemski, a little bit more risky for pinch hit. So there's a lot of question marks for me with that lineup. Otherwise, I think they are, you know, maybe targetable. I picked Jorge Soler as the home run pick of the day, 13.77. I think he's the second overall on the uh, entire slate. 
monster home run upside, only 3,000, 4,600. I like the way that he combines with Jung-Hoo Lee, who is hitting for average and getting on base over the first handful of games. I like Lamont Wade with a little bit of moderate power, gets on base at a great clip, only 2,600, 3,400 across sites. First base only on FanDuel, first base and outfield on DraftKings is kind of interesting. I think Matt Chapman is cheap for all the premium contact he can provide on the right day. Start Adam again, start him out against a righty. Maybe he's, you know, if, if Grove gets through these three guys and then comes back out for the second inning and he faces Chapman, maybe you take the top off of Chapman. Um, but once he gets in there against the lefty, I think there's upside if that's where they go. And Grove, by the way, not really like the elite opener type caliber. 3.97% home run rate allowed. He had a 6.13 ERA. The XFIP was a lot better than the ERA, but he allowed a lot of premium contact and power. He didn't really blow the world away strikeout-wise. So not that threatening in terms of I usually don't target these opener situations because their whole, whole purpose is to take these three guys out of the equation the first time through the lineup. And if you lose a full plate appearance for the top three hitters in your stack, that's not a good thing. But in this one, I don't really see it the same way. Conforto and uh, Jastrzemski, like I said, a little bit more questionable. I think Tyro Estrada stays in, you know, full full game no matter what. Obviously, he's right-handed, so if they bring in a lefty, why would they pinch hit for him? Um, 14 home runs, 23 steals last year, 101 WRC+. Plus. A lot of guys, like, right on the borderline for uh, run creation marks last year. But there's a little bit of sneaky pop in this lineup. I don't completely hate it. It's more probably for me, like, just Jorge Soler one-offs with just, you know, upside for a home run against Michael Grove to start the game. And then significant upside for a home run once once Ryan Yarbrough comes into the game, if that's what they do. So while I don't love the full stack, maybe some short stacks, maybe some Jorge Soler. I do think the top four guys have more safety, but maybe you go like Lee, Soler, Chapman, Estrada, something like that. Get three of the righties and only use one of the lefties. And I think Lee out of all the lefties is probably the safest. Although, you know, he is the rookie technically. Very experienced guy in the KBO, but technically a major league rookie. So a little bit of question marks up and down the Giants lineup, um, but I really like Jorge Soler. The Dodgers are the Dodgers. Uh, that said, Logan Webb is on the mound. Logan Webb, very, very, very good at limiting launch angle, limiting home run potential. 0.6 degree average launch last year, 2.35% home runs. Year before that, 3.1 degree average launch, just 1.40% home runs. Year before that, negative 0.5 degrees, 1.51% home runs. Low barrel rates in the 5% range each of those years, up to 6.9% last year, but still very, very manageable in another strong season. 3.25 ERA at 2.96 XFIP. Doesn't light things on fire with strikeouts, 22.8%. is good, but a very good walk rate at 3.6%. 216 innings, 33 starts, eats innings. I really like Logan Webb, but I wouldn't play him today. Not against this Dodgers team. What I think is the most likely outcome is Logan Webb has a limiting effect on the Dodgers, but the Dodgers still manage to score a few runs against him and limit his overall upside, and then he's out of the game after five or six without a ceiling score, and then maybe the Dodgers can tee off after that. But I don't love the Dodgers stack because Logan Webb's on the mound, and I don't like Logan Webb that much because the Dodgers are at the plate. If you want to go to the Dodgers, you can absolutely roster them here. You can roster them on any slate against any starter this year. They're that good. But they're very, very expensive in a bad spot, even for them, against Logan Webb. Mookie Betts, Shohei Itani, Freddie Freeman. Two super, or three superstars. Three superstars who are rosterable on any slate, any situation. A little bit of multi-position eligibility. They're just impossibly hard to afford. Will Smith, tremendous catcher, 4,400, 3,300, 19 home runs last year. He qualifies for that category of catchers where I'm just saying he's a really good hitter. Um, you could just roll him out there as a DH every day once he can't catch anymore, and that's probably the Dodgers playing because they give him a 10-year extension. But he's very cheap for his skills. Only 16.1% strikeouts last year, 11.4% walks, tremendous on-base percentage. Look at all the on-base from those first four hitters. It's, it's just silly. That's why this Dodgers team is so good. Muncie and Teoscar Hernandez, tons of strikeouts, also tons of home runs from those two hitters. Two very good options uh, in the mid-range price-wise. 3500 they're cheaper than that relative to the DraftKings cap at 43 and 45 Very good prices on DraftKings for those two hitters. James Outman, I like. I think he's underpriced at 4000 2800 um, 23 home runs, 16 steals last year. Upside for a 2020 and uh, beyond type season this year. Gavin Lux, three lefties to end the lineup too. Jason Hayward, Gavin Lux, you can play any of those three guys in combination with any of these guys. 
and build a pretty effective stack, even with Logan Webb on the mound. But like I said, I think it's more like they score three or four against Logan Webb, ruin his fantasy upside, but he still has an okay MLB day, might even get a quality start, right? Gives up three runs, gets to the quality start, but doesn't strike out that many. It's not a great fantasy start, but it limits the Dodgers appeal. So I think there's limits on both of those. I would play Dodgers. I would play limited shares of the Giants just because of the pinch hit question marks. But Jorge Soler is definitely still very appealing for me, and I will have a one-off of Jorge Soler. And I probably, I don't think I would play Logan Webb. Not against this Dodgers team. He's very good. He could succeed here. There's a lot of guys on the board. Logan Webb's all the way down here today. There's a lot of similarly talented pitchers today. So to sum up the slate, cut line for starters drops down the board. I mean, it probably is Logan Webb, although I don't know that I would play Casey Mize. I don't like Jose Barrios at the FanDuel price, but he's playable on DraftKings. I think Adrian Hauser is only okay. I don't know that he's as strong as his projection might be, but for the DraftKings price at 68, I think he's playable. Javier Assad, I like as a value pitcher going up against Colorado if that game plays. A little bit of weather here, a little bit of weather here. A little bit of weather here. Webb, tough matchup against the Dodgers, but that's about the cut line. Nobody down here is really appealing. I love Garrett Crochet in a vacuum, but not against the Atlanta Braves. There is upside for Ronaldo Lopez. If anybody from down here surprises, I think it's probably Lopez. Going up against a weak Chicago team, a little bit of strikeout upside. I just don't know what the depth looks like. Converted back from a reliever into a starting role this year, at least for now. Really like the upside for Shane Bieber against the Mariners, but... It's a high, a high fan duel price. Good price on DraftKings. Love the upside for Luis Castillo on both sites. Think he's very, very playable against Cleveland. That said, maybe a little artificial cap on his strikeout upside. Love Brian Bayo tonight. If I had to guess, it's either from Valdez or Brian Bayo that goes into my main lineup. We'll see. There's not that much of a price difference between the two. I think Bayo probably comes off more popular. We'll see what happens there. But I like both of those options. Home runs. It's not fully sorted. As I said, Jorge Soler was the home run pick of the day. You can see Petey Alonso, if that game plays, standing a little bit taller at 14.3. Only a handful of guys above the magic number today. Fernando Tatis, Francisco Alvarez, Aaron Judge, Jordan Alvarez, Jorge Soler, and Pete Alonso. So two of them coming from the Mets. It's the only team with two on the board. Of course, the Yanks have Juan Soto there. They have Giancarlo Stanton there. Astros have a number of guys also similarly high. Kyle Tucker, not that far off of uh, Jordan Alvarez. All this is up on the site. Full summary power index. All the home run numbers are in the fantasy projection. So uh, you get the projection. You also get the home run mark for every player. All well, that's free up on the site right now. With that in mind, guys, I got uh, 525. We did it. Got out before 5.30. How about that? Hour 52 down. I uh, got to get some basketball projections done. So uh, I'm going to go do that. Going to get those up on the site. Updates for baseball with all the confirmed lineups will go up uh, probably before that. I can knock that out a little bit quicker. So we'll get that done. Keep an eye on everything. Jump into the Discord. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe. Follow the Outroader Scouts Twitter handle if you're not already following that. Like and retweet those things. Helps us out a lot. And jump over to acemind.io. I won't uh, harp on it, but one more time. The promo code to get 20% off your first month is Roto Scouts. With that, you guys rock. Good luck out there tonight. Somebody go win something. We'll be back at it tomorrow.